So hello and welcome along to another edition of Isolation Interviews here for Hospital Radio Reading and of course my YouTube channel um, and my guest I'm super excited to be joined by the fantastic Jeremy Edwards thank you for joining me. Hey, no problem Matthew lovely to be uh, lovely to be here lovely to be and I used to live in Reading by the way. Did so, you? Um, I, yeah I have a strong a, a, a affinity for Reading. I lived in Mortimer which is just outside Reading a little village um, and then my, my brother moved into the town centre. His first job was at the Prudential, where there's lots of people working there through at, Red, at Reading. So I had a lot of time there, spent a lot of time there. So um, yeah, happy to be helping. Wow, fantastic. Well, as I say, it's a pleasure to have you on. And I just wanted to start off by asking about the last year and a half. Obviously, it's been mad for everyone. Mm -hmm. I mean, how have you been affected, you know, personally, professionally, with, with just the ever-changing world we live in? Yeah, I mean, I'm not going to lie to you. It's been... Difficult. The, the initial, if you hear a baby screaming in the background, there's nothing I can do about that. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, for lockdown, um, I, dare I say, uh, once I got over the fear of it, I found it quite relaxing in a way that it was quite peaceful. And I kind of got this feeling of, well, there's nothing I can do. Plus, it was spring slash summer. So going for walks and stuff, it, it wasn't terrible. As it dragged on, it became harder and harder. Um, Personally, obviously, as you know, I went back to Hollyoaks uh, last year um, and that got supposed to be a year. And it got cut short to three months because of filming um, restrictions and they had to sort of change all my storylines, which I wasn't terribly happy about. Um, but there was nothing they could do. It's not their fault. It's just we had to work with what we could. Uh, couldn't really mix with anyone. So it, it sort of as it dragged on, it affected me more and more. And then this year has been particularly difficult actually with it with the with it kicking off again in january and I've, you know it's just it's been it's just too long you know um so i i yeah i found it i'm very glad that we we seem to be on top of it for one of a better word at the moment um and i hope that that's the way forward but it's been difficult but health wise i can't complain you know i i've i was a bit ill for a while um but I got out of it and that was fine. And, you know, I've been absolutely fine and my family have been fine ever since. So I really am very lucky. I count myself very lucky in that respect. I mean, during the sort of the, the, the first lockdown, did you find yourself when you were stuck at home sort of learning any new skills, doing, any, doing anything that you wouldn't otherwise normally do? Unfortunately, no, because of, in fact, I did less because of the childcare, because I've got a four-year-old and I've got a seven-month-year-old. So he was born during the second lockdown um so that was quite awkward as well but i was allowed to, to to attend the birth because it was less restrictive this time than it was the first time so we were just looking after the, the i had a pregnant wife and a, and a four-year-old at the time so all my time was taken up because she wasn't at school or wasn't play groups weren't open uh and what i what i'd like to do is i write a lot um i managed to uh, get some stuff made and i'm sort of working towards doing more that and i all went out the window in fact it just became a survival thing and I wasn't really enjoying my downtime because it was filled with fear, you know? So I couldn't, you need to be in a good headspace to write, I think. And when it, it's a wonderful, wonderful thing. And it, I actually use it almost as a meditative um, process rather than reading. Uh, I tend to write to get out, go escape from the world, you know, and create my own little world, but it wasn't happening. So um, uh, mentally I found it really, really quite tough actually, yeah. I mean, obviously, one of the things that I think people will have really kind of taken to their hearts over the last year and a half is just the amazing work the NHS do. Um, yeah. I think they, you know, at points they maybe have been taken for granted. But I mean, would you agree? Would you do you think that people have really, you know, brought them back to the forefront? Very much so. I mean, <clears throat> I thought, yeah, very much so. I mean, I've just I had an operation on Monday, actually. There you go, for my back. I've had a bad back for ages. And they were just fantastic um uh, it's the kindness you know it's 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 keeping that level of spirit up you know even though they must have been up against it like they've never been before and hopefully never will be and just the constant of just going back and keeping everyone's spirits up when you must be exhausted and uh, and frightened you know and putting yourself in danger uh because let's be honest a lot of the frontline staff initially didn't have the correct ppe uh, weren't being uh, considered as much as perhaps they should be, and other frontline workers, not just NHS, you know, and it took a long time for it all to come in, but I guess no one knew what they were dealing with. But I do think that um, they perhaps had been being taken for granted. My fear is that they very soon will be again, 
because unfortunately, and not just this, I'm not anti-Tory or anti-Labour or anything. I tend to vote with who I think is best for the country. I'm not, I, I, just because I think that's the way you should, you should live. But I do think that people will become more lackadaisical as time goes on and they very quickly forget about how bad it was and all the purse strings will start tightening and they'll start being taken for granted again. And I think that's something we need to be, we need to remind ourselves of moving forward and not ever take them for granted. Now, I wanted to go back to where it all began for you. I mean, where did the interest in acting come from for, you know, for yourself? Well, um, <clears throat> I, I did a lot of acting at school. Uh, I even directed a school play uh, and I won a prize for that. This is quite fun. It's something I'd like to do in the future, more directing. But uh, if I'm honest with you, I was always wanting to write. Um, and without this sounding arrogant, because I looked nice, people would always insist that I had to go in front of the camera. And I, I went to work at Children's BBC um, back in the day when Zoe Ball was doing it and all people like that. And I was working as a researcher for nothing. Um, and they kept saying, oh, you should go in front of the camera and uh, you should do this and you should do that. And I knew Zoe from university, funny enough, we were at uni together. So she was kind of putting me in touch with people and it just kind of snowballed. It was a weird thing. And I think part of it was because I didn't really care. I really wanted to be due to writing and producing. And after six months, I'd had no offer of a firm job offer at the BBC for money. I was working for free. I was working in a cafe every night to pay my bills. So I was working through till like 11 at night and then getting up and going to work for nothing. And I did that for six months and then I couldn't do it anymore. And I had some offers of modeling jobs and I got commercials and it kind of just snowballed from there. So it was an organic thing, which in a way I think is, can be better because you don't get taught a certain way you just learn from other people so I just learned from other people I wasn't terribly good at the beginning I'll admit that uh, but I was very keen to learn and I stuck with it and here I am 26 years later you know still working and doing different things so it's, it's been a blessing in many ways. I mean when you first got the role on Hollyoaks I mean do you remember kind sure. of sort of you know how you were feeling what, what was that like for you when you first joined? Oh I was terrified absolutely terrified there's no two ways about it and um because I went up for the auditions and Will Meller, who played Jambo in it, he and I got on very well. And they kind of cast us together as a pair. Like he was my best friend in it uh, and in life. You know, he's still well, my best friend now. Um, and, you know, I got the scripts and I remember because the auditions I found quite easy because you know, I, I, got a, I got a good brain for remembering stuff. So I'd learned the script quite easy and we'd muck about. Uh, but then when the scripts came, I didn't understand scheduling. I didn't understand that we'd be doing this, this on a, I just thought I had to learn the whole lot, like by Monday. And I was just in tears. <laughs> I was like, oh, I can't, every time I turn the page, I was like, Kurt, Kurt, was like, oh my gosh, I've got so many scenes, you know, because it, at the beginning, Kurt was the main character. That's what it was written around was Kurt and his friends. And I really should have given it to someone with more experience, in my opinion, you know, like Will should have played Kurt and I should have played Jambo because it would have been a lot easier for me to come in for a scene and muck about and disappear. But I was kind of in every single scene at the beginning. I was absolutely terrified. I remember just, and it showed, unfortunately, you know, um, but then I got to understand it. And it's a shame I had to learn on the job in front of millions and millions of people the funny thing is back then we were getting four and a half million viewers and that was considered nothing now like x factor final gets four and a half million viewers you know what i mean um so there you go but it was a it was a, it was a baptism of fire and i mean the other great thing with obviously the character is such an iconic character and and has sort of lived on in although he got killed off and then came back i mean did you ever imagine that would happen i mean for you being asked back all this time later was that a surprise or did you kind of, I mean, how was it? It was a huge surprise. I remember I was at the airport. I was going off to do a corporate gig because I do present, presenting as well, presentation and stuff. So I was going off to Holland to present a, uh, some show. Anyway, I was doing that. One of these little money gigs that you do after you've been on TV for a while. And, uh, and the major right, said, you're not going to believe this, Jeremy. And this was a year before I actually returned. So it was a September two years ago, or three, yeah, whatever a year before I actually went back. I said, they want you to come back. And I was like, what? But and they said, no, no, they can get around that because I died off screen and all this. And I kind of, they killed me. They killed me because of a contract upset, right? Which is really pathetic of the producer at the time. And I've spoken, I've told her this to her face, so it's fine, and we're all friends now. Um, but they didn't kill me on screen for the simple reason that there was always that slight thing of they could bring me back at some point because he just went missing. So 
I was happy with that. But I was, I was really shocked. But I couldn't say no. It's just such a shame that when I went back, because I was really looking forward to it. But the thing I was most looking forward to was getting involved with a lot of the characters. Because I watch it occasionally. And I was like, oh, I really want to work with so-and-so. And like Richard Blackwood and I are good friends from back in the day. And I was saying, oh, I've got to work with Richard. And I can't wait to work with various people. Jamie Lomas I really like as a character. I like Warren Fox. And there's various people I thought I want to come up against them. And I want to be a baddie and a bit of a tough. And so I was really excited. And then, of course, when it came to it, it was just, yeah, you can do some scenes with Nick and then that's going to be it, really. Um, you know, I'm supposed to be going back at some point, or so they said when I left, but I haven't heard anything yet. So, I mean, you, you must enjoy playing such a, a bad character because it, it just looks like so much fun to, to do that kind of character. I mean, what is that like for you? Yeah. Yeah, I mean... Yeah, I think... I think it, you know what's difficult is that I, I'd been playing Mike on Millie in Between for five years. Every summer I did four months in Ireland filming that. I love being Mike. I love being, I am a dad and I love playing a dad and being funny and kind. Uh, and Danny Shaughnessy on Holby, which I did for five years, was a really nice guy. And Kurt was a bit of a bad boy, but he was a nice person. And going back, and I would have liked a longer run at it. So although it was fun, I don't think I probably found my feet. I don't think that the scripts did either. Um, that's you know, just because of the situation. And I think that if I were to go back again, I'd hope that I would be, have a bit more input and uh, be able to hit it a bit more on the ground running because it was all a bit panicky. I don't, I don't feel I did the best job, if I'm completely honest, um, which is sad because I always try my hardest, but it was a very, very unusual situation to pick up something like that. So it was fun. It was getting, it was just getting to be fun when it ended, do you know what I mean? I'd been there for a couple of months. I'd go, okay, I've got it now. I've got it now. And I started to really get into the thing. And then it was like, oh, I'm, I'm off now. <laughs> Bye. And I was just starting. I had some really nice bits towards the end when I was a bit mean to Nick and all the rest of it. And I really enjoyed playing those bits. I really liked saying, you know, telling him what a loser he was and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> that was quite fun, you know. Uh, and we were laughing. We were still laughing like drains when they cut the camera, you know, because like, uh, it's just funny. But, um, yeah, so I, you know, I kind of do. I kind of want to go back. I'm so busy in life that I, I just get on with stuff. But it would be great to go back again. Yeah. And I mean, of course, you know, you mentioned a bit about Holby. You know, you, you, I mean, what was it like working on, on a medical drama and doing that kind of side of things? Oh, that was great. I mean, that was a, that was the, that was a great gig. I was kind of, I felt like I'd cut my teeth on Hollyoaks and I felt like I'd learned enough to move forward and I wanted to go on to grown-up television. And I managed to get myself cast in, in Holby, which was a huge show. I mean, we were getting 12 million viewers. I mean, it was the biggest drama on TV. Uh, after EastEnders, you know, it was certainly, they were number two on BBC after EastEnders. So we were really pulling in the viewers. Good storylines, fantastic actors, you know, a whole, and a whole range of actors, much older actors and more grown-up. And you were allowed to take more time with your delivery, because Hollyoaks is quite fast, 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 and you've got to go, 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 and get as much uh, information into each scene. And with Holby, it wasn't quite like that. It was um, better in that respect, I suppose. Not as much fun, but yeah, it was cool. I mean, I was lucky because I played a, a, a nurse, well, I started playing a porter. I didn't really have to learn any medical jargon. I just had to muck about a bit, um, which was a lot of fun. And it was, a, yeah, it was a great gig. And of course, Lisa Faulkner was there, and she'd been friends, I'd been friends with her because she was on Brookside uh, when I was on Hollyoaks and Angela Griffin was from Corrie and she was dating Will, my mate Will Meller. So I'd knew, known her for a couple of years. So I was just going with another group of friends and except I was in London where I'm from. So it was a, it was a very, I had a very good 10 years all in all, you know, fantastic. And I mean, obviously we know that the sad news that uh, Holby will be coming to an end next year. I mean, are you going to be sad yeah. to see the show go? Oh, incredibly sad. Incredibly sad. I think it's a mistake a huge mistake. They're saying that it's because of logistics. They need to put more work somewhere else. It's, they're doing a new show in Manchester, I think, to rival Corey Street. Why are you doing that? I mean, what's the point? Why would you rival something that's such an iconic show? You just, you, I think you're destined for failure, I'm afraid. Um, move it to Scotland. That's what they did with Waterloo Road. When they had to move stuff, they just moved it to Scotland. You know, film it somewhere else. They moved Casualty from Bristol to, to Cardiff to fulfill that exact remit. It's a studio can be anywhere. I was working in Belfast for five years. You know, you wouldn't know it, but if that's what they need to do in terms of spending the money, I understand that they have a responsibility to share it out, but don't kill off a show that's still consistently doing incredibly well, pulling in viewers, 
tackling issues and has, is also responsible for so many careers and, and, and lives of people. I just think it's, I think it's nonsense. You know, there you go. I think it's utter nonsense. I think it's a crazy decision. I mean, I know that a lot of the fans have been very vocal online, you know, petitions to try and get the show to, to stay because it is so hugely loved. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that's really sweet. I don't think that that'll help. Uh, unfortunately, I don't think... If this, was a, if this was an independent, if this was a commercial station, there's no way they'd be sacking it. There's no way on earth because it's far too popular. It's still up there. It's still one of the most watched shows on TV. It's got a huge following, but they don't need to worry about selling advert space because it's the BBC. If it was ITV, no way on Channel 4, no way would they be getting rid of it because it'd be making them a fortune. It would be paying for a lot of other shows to go on. And that's the sad thing is that somebody's not realizing that, that it's what people want. And I, I think, Again, I think it's, it's, but I don't think anyone will listen because the simple fact is they get the money from the license pair no matter what people say. You can stand up and scream and shout and say, well, we love it, we love it. They don't care. They don't need your money because they're getting your money anyway. So there you go. I'm, I, I, again, I can't say it enough. I think it's a ridiculous decision. Um, and once it's gone, it's gone. Although having said that, they're bringing back Waterloo Road. There uh, is that. <laughs> so they're bringing back uh, Footballers' Wives as well. So, yeah. Uh, who knows you know maybe they'll just bring it back in 10 years time when someone's finally admitted that they made a mistake now i mean going forward is there a dream something that you would love to do that you haven't had the chance to do uh, as as of yet yeah i'd like to direct a feature film i've i wrote and directed a short film which did very well it's available on itunes it's called the lock-in have a check it out um and I've written quite a number of scripts and I'm working with various producers to try and get them made, which would be great. That's kind of the direction I'm heading in. And I, if I get some of my films made, then I'm then going to push to start directing them. And I think the day when I'm sat with a director's chair and my name on the back of it, I won't, well, I, I won't be in front of the camera. I would be behind, you know, doing that. I think it's a natural progression for any actor. If you've been doing it for as long as I have, you should have a feel and an eye for it. Um, and I think that that's the challenge for me. You know, I think that would be, exciting one of the guys uh, leon lopez who directs hollyoaks and then various shows now cory uh, uh and lots of things uh, death in paradise he was doing recently he's a friend of mine he was an actor on brookside and he made the switch and he's really enjoys it and i was kind of jealous of it he in fact directed my last scenes on this return with hollyoaks and we we're old mates and i was like oh he's going yeah it's great so i think that's something to look forward to and it's fresh and it's interesting you know there's only so long you can be a puppet for other people and you want to start pulling the strings yourself you know and I mean, I imagine, you know, when you get to do that, that I mean, it, it, are there stories in your mind that you want to tell or, or is it kind of something that you're just excited to see what, what's on offer? Oh, no, there's definitely stories in my mind. I've written, I've written a romantic comedy about stuntmen. I've written a political thriller. I've written a kind of a sexy, steamy show about gym people working in a gym. Um, I write all different kinds of stuff. Some of it's quite, I'm writing, I'm trying to write one at the moment, but I can't seem to get my head into space. Uh, another political, I studied politics for my degree, you see, so I've got quite a polit good political knowledge about, about the workings of Whitehall and, and versus the, uh, it sounds boring, but it <laughs> versus it, captains of industry, um, which sounds boring, but it could be really interesting because it might open people's eyes to understanding why governments do what they do. Um, so some things are serious, some things are quite glib. Uh, it's the ideas, but uh, right now I need to try and get people to, to, to read and get on board and I've got some good interest so far and then once I get to a position of getting things made then I can start saying okay now if you want to make this next film I get to direct it but you've got to take your time with these things because there's people you know you've got to queue up everyone's queuing up you've got, to, you've got to earn your rights you know now I just want to say it's been a pleasure talking to you but before we go is there any messages okay. you'd like to give uh, to any of the patients who are, are in hospital at the moment uh, anything you'd like to say to them at all well, just to, you know, um, I obviously wish you all a speedy recovery and I just hope that everyone's, I'm sure they're being looked after so well and just to, I don't know really, I was going to say to be thankful, but I think everyone that is, I've not bumped into a single person that's been in an NHS hospital that hasn't come out and said, oh my gosh, what a fantastic job they did. What wonderful people. So I'd really like to give a message to the staff just to say, thanks, let's keep it up. And um, whether it's COVID related or, or anything, I don't, you know, just the way you are, that constant positivity, and I know it must be tiring. Um, and thank you, just a big thank you for looking after everyone. And uh, we, we love you, we genuinely do. 
Thank you so much, Jeremy. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you for giving up your time. And of course, keep safe. Yeah, and you, and you. Thanks again, Matthew. Take it easy.